Good morning, this is Nick Holland with Information Security Media Group, and I'm joined today by Jeremy Snyder, who's the Senior Director of Business Development and Solutions Engineering for the Cloud Security Practice at Rapid7. Jeremy's going to be discussing anatomy of a cloud breach. This presentation will explain um, why cloud security is fundamentally different from traditional data center environments. We'll also explore the top services and errors that have led to large scale data breaches in the past several years, discuss ways to prevent future breaches, and review a few case studies of those prominent breaches. Jeremy, how about you? Thank you very much, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm really excited to share on this topic with the audience that we've got uh, assembled here today, and thanks to all of them for taking some time to talk about the anatomy of a cloud breach. I'm just going to take a quick second to talk about my background, how I got into this space, and then I want to go through kind of why the cloud is different and why that's important when we think about data and data breaches and how they can happen. And as you mentioned, we'll go through two different case studies, one around Booz Allen Hamilton, the second around Capital One. Both of these are from the last couple of years. Pretty prominent breaches, I would say. Both, you know, were certainly covered by mainstream media as well as specialist media in the information security and cloud spaces in particular. And I chose these two because they share some interesting similarities, but then some differences that are really key to understanding good cloud security strategies. And that's what we'll close with today is a little bit of a message and some sharing of best practices that I've picked up over the last few years around what good strategies are regarding cloud security. So how did I get here? How did I, you know, come to be talking to you about cloud security today? Well, you know, for the first 10 years of my career, I ran data centers for a variety of software companies, software as a service companies and uh, online video games. And then in 2010, I made a transition into the cloud world, working for one of the uh, big three cloud vendors uh, around the world, actually for the market leader. And it was a fascinating time because we were at the very beginning of the transition from on-prem to cloud at that point. And what I learned through that is that there's a not, uh, there, there's, not just a technology shift that happens as you move to the cloud, there's also a people shift and a process shift and a lot of a mind shift, uh, a mindset and a thinking shift that needs to go on to, uh, to successfully execute on that transition. And I've been doing nothing but cloud ever since. So for the last 10 years, a heavy focus on the cloud space, uh, both, you know, at one of the cloud vendors and then in the ecosystem ever since, helping large scale enterprises migrate to the cloud with a particular focus on security. And then, you know, for the last five years, kind of racking up an average of about 100,000 miles a year for the last several years, traveling around the world, talking to very large scale cloud adopting companies, whether those be traditional enterprise or uh, let's say hyper growth um, uh, unicorn startups that are cloud native corporations and learning from both of those groups about how they're thinking about cloud security, what some of the key challenges are, and then designing risk mitigation factors with them to help them stay on track. Um, I do have quite an international background. Uh, if we happen to get any questions in other languages, bring them on. But uh, anyway, let's dive in um, and let's talk about, you know, the cloud, what it is, why it's different. So uh, I think, you know, one thing that is really important to understand is why companies are moving to the cloud. I know there's a lot of talk, especially at the initial phases when companies are kind of planning or thinking about a move to the cloud, about cost savings and reducing their IT spend. And that is definitely something that can be achieved in a move to the cloud. Um, but there's, you know, there's more nuance in that consideration than I think uh, a lot of people appreciate. Uh, certainly the total cost of ownership of a cloud platform versus a, a data center platform can be lower when you factor in things like 24 seven coverage, you factor in things like hardware standbys and so on. Um, but you know, not every workload looks the same. And if, for instance, you're running a large scale, let's say HIPAA workload where you require dedicated hypervisors running on bare metal and maybe some specialized GPU capabilities for data processing, um, you know, that may be actually more expensive to run on the cloud from a raw infrastructure perspective. So the cost savings, I think, is often something that is cited, but it's a, a secondary benefit. And the real benefit of moving to the cloud is the agility. And I think agility is actually super important to understand because it also informs some of what we need to think about from a mitigation perspective on the security side. So there's two types of agility. And I think this article on CIO.com uh, was actually quite helpful. Uh, it's you know, cloud computing, two kinds of agility. For anybody who's interested, I do recommend it. 
it points out that you know one type of agility that everybody's looking for is just the ability to go faster. So we think about the speed of deployment. We think about a transition from, let's say, an old fashioned data center process where anytime an engineer needs access to a new server, they open a ticket and you know, in something like four weeks to four months, they have a new virtual machine that's you know, been uh, powered up and is ready for them to access. Well, you can go from that, let's say four weeks down to three minutes on something like AWS EC2 or using an Azure virtual machine. So that speed of deployment is actually really critical. It can reduce the wait times dramatically and it can increase the time to test and the time to launch. And those are really important factors in a you know, super competitive modern marketplace. However, what I think is actually more important is the business flexibility and the business agility that you get around it. If we take a step back and we think for a second, you know, what some of the real benefits of cloud are, we know that there are benefits around the ability to scale. But we also know that there are benefits around the ability to pay as you go and the ability to pay only for what you're consuming. So we think about that for a second. What you're consuming might change from today to tomorrow. And that might be a function of, you know, needing to run a different set of applications or needing to store a different kind of data tomorrow versus today. That is the fundamental challenge that I think cloud solves better than really anything else, right? It's a shifting landscape where my needs are different uh, today versus tomorrow. And when I get to tomorrow and what I have today isn't sufficient, no problem. I can just shut it down you know, delete it, remove it from my accounts and walk away from it with no further obligation to pay for it or maintain it or really do anything with it. You know, I'm free and clear of that legacy infrastructure from that point forward. And that's not the case in data center and co-location environments. What we see is that corporations are often very slow to move away from legacy infrastructure because of the dollars invested, even if that infrastructure is not serving their needs anymore. So the ability to adapt, the ability to, you know, have that flexibility and, and agility to change what you have is actually the real value in making a move to the cloud. Great. So let's talk about the growth rates in cloud right now. I think there's been a lot of talk, especially in the last six months. Um, but prior to the last six months, cloud was already growing like crazy. So at a time when let's say good GDP growth is generally viewed as something between two to 4%, uh, the cloud has been growing at an 18% year over year um, uh, CAGR rate, uh, whatever that stands for, you know, consolidated annualized growth rate or sorry, compounded annualized growth rate, right? Um, and there's are estimates that say that 38% of workloads are in public cloud right now. So 38% of workloads, you know, to put that in, let's say a scale perspective, if we just look at one vendor, granted it's the leading vendor in this space, their quarterly revenue is now greater than 35 billion. So we know that these growth rates are happening on top of a market that's already quite large and is only growing. Uh, you know, this is a one-way trend, right? We don't see a lot of moves to the cloud that then turn around and pull back and go on premise. And in the last six months under this COVID-19 situation that we're all experiencing together, we've seen some really interesting shifts in how business is getting done. Um, a recent survey found that a lot of businesses have reported that, you know, even if they were doing 50% of their uh, consumer interactions online prior, they've now moved from 50 up to 90%. You hear about things like, you know, contactless orders, contactless payments, really, you know, start to finish, no contact between the consumer and the business. Well, this is a, a emblematic uh, statistic, I think, that highlights that. On a numbers basis, Q2 saw a 37% higher acceleration rate than the same quarter last year. So that means that from last year, 2019, the second quarter, the growth rate that was in place, this year's is 37% higher. So that's a dramatic increase, again, on an industry that's already quite large. So very soon, cloud is going to be something that every enterprise, every business has at least some of their infrastructure built on. And every business is going to need to think about securing the data that they're storing on their cloud platforms. So let's talk about that security and let's talk about the shift in thinking around security. I'd say, you know, if I look back on how I ran data centers for the first 10 years of my career, I had a very strong focus on the network layer, specifically at the perimeter. And the goal of my security posture was to keep bad actors out. So I put a lot of emphasis on my firewalls. I put a lot of emphasis on the rules that I had there. I followed best practices around, 
you know, deny all statements and only explicit allows on the traffic that I wanted. But what I didn't do was put a lot of security behind my perimeter. So once anybody was inside my perimeter, if they were able to breach one of my servers, they pretty much had access to all the data on that server and then could go from there to other places around the, uh, around the network. And that's pretty common. So the goal, you know, perimeter focus, keep threats out of my environment. Well, I wanted to take a look at a cloud architecture that kind of mimics a traditional data center environment where we don't have a lot of the add-on services. What we really have is just, you know, one internet facing connection, which you could think of as kind of the equivalent of a router. We've got a network segment uh, with route tables, load balancers, and we have security groups in there in line that are providing that same kind of um, uh, NAT capability as well as port and protocol filtering. Um, and if we look at this diagram, and this is again, you know, a very simple architecture designed to kind of mimic a data center. What we see is a couple things. First of all, there are over 20 different security configurations on the same simple diagram. So one thing that I think is, is both a plus and a minus or, or both a strength and a weakness in cloud is that there are so many security touch points. It's a strength because we can really achieve an extremely high level of control and security on a cloud platform, but it's a weakness in the sense that it's difficult for humans to manage all of those touch points. We're going to talk later about good strategies around managing that and how we can kind of consolidate our visibility onto different security configurations and different security controls with in this environment. Um, but the other thing that's different about it is that you'll notice that inside this environment, we've got a number of features that are designated as private and public, but you'll see that I have a public facing subnet sitting behind uh, an internet gateway. So this is you know, something like my DMZ, and then I've got two-way traffic controls between that and my private subnet. So I would ask the question, you know, in this simple environment, if you think about where the perimeter is, you could look at a couple of those network layers. We're going to look for in a couple minutes at a more complex cloud architecture that starts to include some of the real uh, beneficial value add uh, services that the cloud platforms offer. And those have public facing capabilities as well, no matter where they're sitting in your architecture. So even though you think that a component or a service is really shielded behind your perimeter, it has controls that can override perimeter security and make it available to the public. That's going to come into factor in a couple of the data breaches that we talk about today. Um, so bear that in mind, you know, where is the perimeter? That's a moving target on cloud platforms and it's not sufficient to think about perimeter security as a, as a viable strategy on its own. From a scale perspective, how big is the problem of cloud data breaches? How prevalent is it? Um, a couple of data points that I wanted to share. Um, first, you should understand if you're making the move to the cloud or if you've already made the move, you probably already know this. There is something called the shared responsibility model, which is kind of the line of demarcation between what you control and what the vendor that you're working with controls on your behalf. Providers are responsible for security of the cloud. Customers are always responsible for their own data and their own data security in the cloud. That's the way that I like to talk about it. Um, you can look at some great diagrams around SaaS, software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service to get where that breakdown lies. But suffice it to say that across all three of those different cloud models, data uh, security is always the responsibility of the customer. In the last uh, several years, uh, we've done some research on the number of cloud breaches, the types of breaches, how they happen, and so on. Um, suffice it to say that, you know, again, under that shared responsibility model, more than 95% of the breaches have been the customer's fault. Um, there are effectively, you know, there are very, very few cases of a provider error that led to a data breach. How big is the problem? Well, you know, the, I think the statistic that really popped out to me is that over the last two years, if we look at the consolidated aggregate of the breaches that we've tracked, we see 33 billion records exposed. And these can be a range of different record types, everything from, you know, individual consumer uh, data records, things like, um, you know, let's say a bank record or a social security record or a job application or something like that, down to, you know, internal uh, intranet sites or email systems or who knows what. Um, but we're tracked 33 billion records exposed across uh, just over 200 data breaches uh, over the last major data breaches over the last several years. Uh, that was 81 in 2018 
and it jumped up uh, nearly 50% to 115 in 2019. So if we put that in the context of the growth uh, that's happening in the cloud writ large, uh, we can expect these numbers to rise over the next several of years. Um, and then, you know, a recent kind of survey that included some assessments did show that over 75% of cloud users do have at least one security misconfiguration in their environment, uh, typically at the storage layer. That can be something like an AWS S3 bucket, Azure blob storage, et cetera. And then interestingly, for, you know, for all the benefit that fast moving, fast changing infrastructure can bring you, uh, the finding was that actually 80% of customers have unpatched infrastructure that has been running on their cloud environments for over 180 days. So they're not necessarily following those best practices, either with regards to patching or with regards to using immutable ephemeral infrastructure. Uh, when we dive into some of the different services that are being used uh, across different organizations and we look at you know, where these data breaches are happening, um, and this is kind of the more complex architecture that I mentioned a minute ago, we can see that you know, the S3 bucket has been the champion many years in a row, uh, champion in a bad way in the sense that this is the most common site of a data breach in a cloud uh, infrastructure environment. Um, but interestingly, we're seeing an increasing number of, um, of breaches happening on some newer uh, kind of modern database technologies, NoSQL technologies, you'll often hear them called. Elasticsearch and MongoDB in specific, uh, Redis being another one that was mentioned, um, and then Azure Blob Storage. So, you know, AWS has been the market leader historically, but we've seen uh, strong growth out of Azure, I think, across the market, and that's been well publicized. And of course, as Azure grows, so does the risk of, uh, of customers making mistakes in their own configurations as, as, as the Azure overall footprint grows. Um, so I would kind of recommend to everybody to think holistically. Um, you know, it's not sufficient to think about the network layer on its own. As I mentioned, you know, the perimeter is kind of a moving target when it comes to cloud environments. Um, but then also don't think only of this infrastructure layer that I've talked about for the last few minutes. We're going to talk in a, in a couple minutes in one of our case studies about um, problems at the application or website layer, right? Um, so it does need to be a holistic view towards uh, kind of the stack. And we'll talk about that at the end when we talk about uh, recommendations for best practices in cloud security. Okay, um, so just to make sure that people think that this isn't just a, okay, there's a lot of problems out there. Uh, this is actually costing a huge amount of money. Um, so the estimated cost of an individual breach incident is 3.86 million. That's per a study by IBM recently. Um, and that's measured as both direct and indirect effects. You can think of direct effects as being things like, you know, the cost of hiring external consulting firms to, uh, you know, per perform forensics around this, determine the uh, forensics or mitigation around it. And indirect effects can be things like reputational damage to the organization, loss of business, and so on. Um, I think one of the most depressing stats that I came across as I was putting this together was that most breaches are closed after 280 days, meaning that the, you know, the vulnerability has been out there for 280 days. Again, whether that is, you know, an open S3 bucket or an unpatched operating system. And, um, you know, it's, it seems like such a low branch to get over, but if you can close in less than 200 days, you can save your organization a million dollars on average by just, you know, reducing the time to remediation of these things. Um, and then actually one, one bright side that I saw was that custom companies that automate security save 3.58 million on average per year, per year, right? And that's, uh, again, mixed as a, to as a blend of, averted costs on things like remediation and payouts and on man hours towards, you know, just the labor towards uh, patching and security remediation. Um, we talked about those 33.4 billion records exposed. Excuse me, a recent study found that the cost per average uh, cost on average per record is $150. You can think of that as being things like communication to the end customer whose data was breached, as well as things like um, 
uh, identity theft prevention services or identity protection services. So if you've ever gotten one of those letters or maybe you've gotten three or five or however many over the last few years that says, hey, your data was breached, we regret to inform you and we're offering you 12 months of LifeLock or Identity Guard or whatever those services are. You know, that's where that $150 uh, can also be paid. Um, but the net effect of this is actually $3.18 trillion. Um, this on its own is, is you know, greater than the total cloud market is estimated to be. So there is a little bit of a tension between the growth in the cloud market and the impact that it can have. Um, there's so many great benefits, but I do see a number of customers uh, hesitating to go full scale into cloud because of the, you know, the scale of this problem and the potential impact that it can have on them. So let's talk about two examples that we've got, and then we're going to get to some best practice uh, recommendations. So the first one from 2017, Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, this was a classic open S3 bucket. We saw from our architecture, and we're going to have a look at that again in a minute. Um, you know, where is the perimeter? It's a little bit fuzzy. Um, what was a little bit uh, interesting about this breach, you know, simple single attack point, right? So the attack surface was one single item, but from that, the bad actors were able to obtain credentials plus information that led them to attack other parts of the infrastructure. The recovery was relatively complex, you know, both in terms of kind of recovering the network and the infrastructure resources themselves, locking them down or wiping them out, uh, performing forensics around it, publicity and communications. Um, it's a relatively complex process, especially in an organization where you're dealing with customers like the Department of Defense, who will understandably have, you know, high requirements when it comes to documentation and compliance around the process. So uh, from an architecture perspective, we could see this as being, you know, access to the bucket that led to then access to other components within the system because of credentials contained within the bucket. And the bucket, for those that are interested and maybe don't know, think of an S3 bucket as a kind of virtual infinite disk drive in the sky, although realistically it's more likely in Northern Virginia. Um, great. And let's go on to our second uh, Cloud Breach case study from Capital One 2019. Uh, this one was very widely publicized because this one touched 100 million American citizens and 6 million Canadians, lest we forget. Um, this was interesting because it was a multi-vector attack. It consolidated uh, vulnerabilities at the application layer with the configuration layer, and actually identity compromise was the key to actually getting the data. So let's play this out for a second here. So we can see that the first thing that happened was that a individual uh, virtual machine was compromised through an application layer security uh, uh, problem. That machine actually had an identity associated with the machine. So even though the bad actor didn't have any credentials of their own in accessing the network, they were able to leverage a set of credentials that was associated to the server itself. Those permissions from those credentials allowed the uh, access to the data layer to go explore the network, find data sources, and then ultimately exfiltrate the data. So if we play that out, we can see that first was to the web server. From the web server, the identity leverage to go get the S3 bucket. Well, first find and then get the S3 bucket, and then the data exfiltrated from there. So it's a more complex multi-layer attack. We see a couple of commonalities between the two data being stored in S3 buckets. Uh, we also see, you know, a combination of vectors in this cloud, uh, sorry, in this Capital One attack, application plus operating system plus identity layer. So my recommendations when we think about getting cloud security right, it's a full stack approach. And it's very important to understand the shared responsibility model. So you know, if we work, you know, think of this stack as kind of building from the base layer up. So we've got the cloud provider that we're partnering with. Uh, they are responsible for that, for their provider layer, which is the physical infrastructure plus the hypervisor, the virtualization layer. Everything on top of that is the responsibility of the customer. The good thing is when it comes to cloud, there are, um, everything is software defined. And when it's software defined, that means that all the security controls are actually done through configuration. Configuration can be monitored in real time and it can also be inspected automatically. So we can actually deploy software to inspect the software defined infrastructure that we're using in the cloud environment. We can monitor for a change in real time, like I said, uh, and um, when we think about the network identity and compute and storage layers, kind of the middle three layers there, 
all of those are configuration driven for their security controls and can be automated, uh, both the inspection and the remediation. And that's a recommendation that I would strongly urge. Second, on the identity side, um, good governance is the number one thing. So having visibility into the identities that are out on your network and what they can do, I think is actually the, the first step in, in establishing good control over your users. Um, there are other recommendations around least privilege. So for instance, in the Capital One case, if that set of credentials hadn't had broad permissions, that uh, attack could have been mitigated uh, to a much larger degree. And then last recommendation is again, think holistically, do select you know, best in breed what's right for you at the application in the data layers above uh, all the layers below. So that's kind of you know, some good practices that I've learned. Automate, monitor for in real time, um, and you know, don't forget identity layer and, uh, and then the other layers above it. For those that are interested, you know, Divi Cloud is one tool, but by no means the only one in this space, focuses on kind of real-time harvesting for visibility into, uh, into those changes. So kind of that real-time monitoring I talked about, and then building a model around the infrastructure and then analyzing that for problems. And then again, because all of this is software defined, it can also be remediated through software uh, with automated, um, automated processes to take action and correct anything around those layers. Um, for those that are interested, you know, Divi Cloud can look at identity layers, compute storage network, everything that we talked about, and again, automate those problems um, and give you, give you statistics around that. We've got a number of resources available for those that are interested, as well as these slides themselves for those that would like it. Um, we've got a couple of reports that are available to anybody in the audience. And uh, Nick, I think that's, you know, that's pretty much it from my side. Um, you know, I wanna thank you so much for having me here. And I, I think if we've got some time, we'd be happy to take some questions. Jeremy, thank you so much for that. That's uh, this Jeremy Snyder of uh, DiviCloud by Rapid7 and for Information Security Media Group, I'm Nick Holland.